Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. Today's episode is another recording from a remote location, but this time I didn't have to travel nearly as far as Washington, D.C., and that's because last month the joint meeting of ichthyologists and herpetologists was held just down the street from my home in Norfolk, Virginia. The organizing societies were kind enough to let me attend and talk to some of the meeting's presenters and participants. I had a great time, and it's now my pleasure to share with you some of the conversations that I had while I was there. And I'll include a link in the show notes so that you can learn more about the meeting and its organizing societies, and I hope attend next year. First up on the docket are Sinlan Pu, who is curator of research at the Memphis Zoo and affiliated with Arkansas State University, and Prasanta Chakrabarti, who is curator of fishes and a professor at LSU's Museum of Natural Science, as well as being the current president of the American Society of Ichthyologists and Herpetologists, which was one of the organizations that convened the meeting. They joined me to talk about the Zoo Moo Symposium, which was held as part of the meeting. And I would also be remiss in not mentioning that Zoo Moo was also the subject of a recent bioscience article. I'll include a link to that piece in the show notes. But in the meantime, let's hear from our guests about the Zoo Moo Symposium and what exactly that term means. Thank you both very much for joining me today. Thank you. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Okay, so um, today we're going to be talking about Zumu, and I was hoping you could just tell me a little bit about what the idea behind that is. The idea behind Zumu uh, is to, a, a few different things, but mainly to connect zoos with natural history museums, because both of them work on collections of animals. Okay, great. And you know, what's, the, what's the reason for doing it? The, well, so it started because uh, um, we realized that people who work with animals or collections at museums don't really know that they have counterparts in zoos. So I work for a zoo. I went to a meeting with some other zoo colleagues and realized there were a lot of you know, colleagues that worked in natural history museums. We all work on different types of herps or extant herps. Uh, um, and we didn't really know that much about each other. Um, so we wanted to kind of start a group to start a dialogue so that there could be hopefully more collaboration and information sharing. What are some of the you know, areas on, on which you might collaborate? What are the, what are the crossovers? What are, where, where are the opportunities for synergy, say? So we kind of you know, talked about different things. We had two workshops where we gathered a bunch of people. We had the same question that you had, is what, how, you know, what are the themes that we want to work on and what are even the questions? Uh, um, so we had two workshops uh, uh, um, for people to start talking and what it distilled down to was kind of three different areas um, that we wanted to work together on. One is a physical um, transfer of specimens. So zoos have these animals and you know when they die, um, right now there's not a good way of transferring them to the Natural History Museum so they can be kept long term. Right. Um, the second is all the data that goes with it. So zoos have all the data on animal husbandry, nutrition, behavior when it's alive. Um, museums have all the data for, you know, bone structure, DNA, all of these things after. Currently the databases don't talk to each other. Um, so we would like to connect the databases so that it's searchable on each end. So the data is, you know, under the FAIR principle. So it's, you know, reproducible and accessible. Um, and then the third is connecting humans. Uh, um, so researchers, staff, curators that work with zoos or work under zoos with um, people that work in natural history museums. And does the extended specimen network play into this in any way? It does. Uh, um, it is kind of, I would say, under this larger umbrella of the extended specimen, right? So you have one individual animal, all its data, um, that can hopefully be all connected in some way. Currently, the live data is not really collected to the data, the preserved specimen data, just like I guess a lot of field notes may not be collected, but there's kind of efforts on different ends to work more under the extended specimen concept, so I guess we're a version of that. Oh, that's really cool. And uh, Prasanta, how did you get involved in this? Yeah, it was interesting. It was, it was in these dark COVID times, and I was invited as a museum person to an online workshop. I was like, usually I check out after about three seconds during an online workshop. And it was the most engaging and interesting thing because it, it filled this gap and built a bridge between zoos and museums. Because we at museums are often getting specimens from all over, from the wild. There's birds hitting windows that people bring in. 
And with zoos, it's often like, well, why don't we have a better connection with these folks that have all this data about their animals that we can now transfer once the animal is deceased, can be continue living as data in a museum. And so as long as it has you know, data, it's still living to us at the museum world. So it's this sort of portal between the living and the dead. And I was just, I, I remember being so engaged and loving the what we were hearing, and that's how I got involved. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a that's a very exciting idea that, you know, um, it, it's, is it one that had not been widely considered before, you know, this, this occasion? I think there's been, you know, people that have started, you know, relationships between zoos and museums. I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't say that this is first or pioneering by uh, any means, but I, but probably not systematic uh, in that way. So a lot of these zoos and museum relationships are built, um, are personal relationships. So you might have a curator that knows researcher really well. Um, when that person retires, then that bond is kind of broken. So what we kind of wanted to do is create a framework where uh, it can be, uh, um, more just in the system rather than just you know single kind of one kind of one off relationships if that makes sense no that makes a lot of sense you know uh, bioscience published a feature not too long ago about um, you know what happens to natural history collections when the primary curator retires and it and it's it's very upsetting a lot of the time it's not maintained um, and this sounds like a way of you know kind of building that structure in so that those relationships are you know evergreen more or less yeah so hopefully it, it builds into something that's institutional right that that becomes a practice yeah. that maybe starts from a few few really smaller relationships but then just becomes a norm of like this is how we operate this is how you know we work that's really cool um, let's chat a little bit about the symposium tomorrow um, and obviously this will come out Far, a little while after the after the meeting is over, um, but what types of things are going to be discussed and, and kind of you know chatted about at that? So the symposium is going to be a mix of you know we'll have an opening talk of the Zumu project what what initiated it and what how we're doing a, a few years into this and, and hopefully some future plans uh, if we can get uh, some funding to to um, work on this project, uh, but then after that we have. Um, people that work in museums uh, uh, collections um, that have some relationship to zoos, people who work on zoo projects, um, and then um, people from universities that work with both zoos and museums and how kind of the specimens can be used in a different way. That's an exciting element that we hadn't talked about, the, va the value for the research effort of, of kind of bringing these, you know, bits of data and specimens together. Um, is, that, is that something you're looking forward to? Yeah, that's something that I think, uh, um, for me personally, that's the one of the most exciting parts. So I am a researcher at a zoo. Uh, I you know work with less than 1% of our zoo animals. And what I want is for everybody else to use a zoo. Right. It's almost a library that's not being used, right? So yeah. we have all these animals, we have all the data, we have this resource, nobody knows or thinks about it. So what I want is to kind of get the word out from this collection so somebody else can work with these animals and make use of it. Um, so that part is particularly exciting to me. Yeah, that, I mean, it, and it sounds so. Um, is there anything else that we should cover that we haven't discussed already? Uh, one interesting thing that I learned from that workshop is, so the process that once an animal becomes deceased at a zoo, there's often a very heavy necropsy. And so at museums, we like specimens that can tell us and give us data about the body of the animal plus the DNA of the animal. Yeah. And sometimes the DNA is overlooked. And so we have, you know, dozens of liquid nitrogen freezers, uh, sorry, doers and fridges that have the DNA of all these animals that people can be loaned all across the world. And what I learned from the necropsy stuff from zoos is often those are done sort of, uh, uh, diligently and in a way that doesn't make the specimen as useful as it would be to a museum and it's one of those discussions like maybe zoo folks didn't know how useful it would be to keep uh, do a cleaner dissection for the same amount of data that they want and that that can be a more valuable museum specimen and that was just for me that was very eye-opening it wasn't something that I think a discussion that wasn't having it wasn't being had before I mean that sounds very exciting that you know you can you get the chance to um leverage and create data that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. Yeah, and I think just to add on to that, it's because 
I don't think we talk enough to each other, so you don't know what the other person is interested in. Uh, um, so a lot of the early conversations were just figuring out, you know, for the zoo to figure out, oh, you actually are interested in these animals because when the animal dies, the zoo has, you know, less interest in it. Uh, um, and for the museum to think that, oh, actually, I have a zoo nearby that have these animals that would be very hard for me to collect in the wild that would fill some sort of gap. Uh, um, so it's talking to each other more and then figuring out, I mean, there's a lot of obstacles that I won't go into, but figuring out how to bypass them. And then one of the is what Prasanda was talking about is, you know, zoos do necropsies for pathological reasons, but, but um, if a vet knows that, let's say, a museum is interested in the species, sometimes there's duplicates that we can save that we don't have to necropsy, or we can do a cosmetic necropsy. So that's getting into too much detail, but it's an example of uh, um, a solution that can be found if you communicate more. Yeah, and so often in these conversations, we wind up chatting about the value of communication and you know reaching across mm -hmm. disciplines, and this sounds like a perfect example of that. Thank you both very much for chatting with me today. I've learned a lot, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And next up, I had a chance to sit down with Karen Cassers from Old Dominion University, which is also located in Norfolk, Virginia, where she's a master's student studying under Dr. John Whiteman. She joined me to talk about cottonmouths, which are a snake I typically try to avoid, uh, but I was very fascinated by it in our chat. So let's go straight to that discussion. Thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. Okay, so uh, I was hoping we could start off with a little bit of a chat about um, your talk that you're going to be giving. Um, when is that talk, by the way? Uh, it's tomorrow at 2.15 p.m. Okay, <laughs> not nervous, are you? Oh, super nervous. <laughs> Totally reasonable, but I'm sure it'll go great. Um, so what's the what's the general topic of the discussion? So I'm going to be discussing about if uh, Florida cottonmouths uh, need fresh water. There's these uh, populations of cottonmouths found in uh, outside of the peninsula of Florida where they are relying solely on rainfall to be able to um, drink uh, water for their water balance. And that's very unusual for them being that they need fresh water they're not able to extract the salt from the ocean water and therefore we i'm trying to see if these snakes are using other sources of water inputs to be able to uh, get some water okay so in this case you know snakes will need the will need fresh water of some sort in some way and the island that they're inhabiting is has no you know ponds lakes rivers underground aquifers or anything like that it's just a Yep, it's totally just a small island with surrounded by ocean water, but nothing of sorts, any, no permanent freshwater sources. Okay, so um, obviously they're getting their freshwater somehow, uh, but how do you find out how that works? So how I'm finding out about how they maintain water balance is by looking at their oxygen isotopes found in their body water. So my advisor, Dr. John Wyman, has established a novel method that looks at the oxygen isotopes, or I should call it Big Delta 17, which is just, um, it's just kind of acts like a, wa a natural water tracer. And when you establish like a Big Delta 17 value, we know that the uh, water found like rainfall water is at 41 per meg, but then there's metabolic water and metabolic water is produced inside of your body. And this water is uh, produced in the mitochondria by like by the hydrogens found there. When you breathe in oxygen, it combines with those hydrogens to produce this water. And this can act as a water source because there's like small mammals like kangaroo rats are solely dependent on this type of water. They are not drinking any type of uh, rainfall water or anything in the desert. They're solely depending on metabolic water. So I wanna see if these snakes are getting water through metabolic water rather than drinking water. Oh, okay, that, that's cool. So, I mean, it, in a sense, gives you a way of finding out whether um, you know, the snakes or whatever it might be is drinking mm -hmm. or making their own water on, mm -hmm. on the fly, as it were. Exactly, pretty much. And that's, um, and pretty much with this method, I'm able to find that with, um, they have the 41 uh, per meg value uh, for 
precipitation water and everything. And then metabolic water has like a negative 447 per meg value of big delta 17 -o. So when I find the big delta 17 value of that animal, I'm able to establish how much uh, rainwater they may be drinking and how much metabolic water they're also contributing to their body water pool. Okay, that's cool. And so can we get a sneak preview on what types of things you're finding out? Oh, so I'm finding out very cool stuff. It seems like some of the, so in the project that I'm working on, uh, I was able to get archive samples from a study published by Sandfoss and Lily White in 2019, which they looked at the water relations of these snakes and they they didn't know, they weren't able to find out as much as I was with this new established method, but they divided the experiment between a field experiment and then brought back these snakes to the University of Florida and then put them through a hydration experiment and a dehydration experiment. So for the field experiment, they took samples from the from the insular population, so the ones in the islands with no permanent water uh, sources, and they took one from the mainland locations and through those uh, through those findings, we found that there's about a 10 to 15 per meg difference in between uh, the snakes found in the insular location compared to the mainland location, and the insular location is technically more negative, so they are, they, that suggests they may be relying more on metabolic water than the mainland locations. Okay, that's cool. Now, another question, are they adapted in any way, like in an evolutionary sense, for doing this? Um, that particular population, or is this just, you know, a, a group of snakes that came over, you know, some recent period? Ago? Yeah, they, I think it, I believe it was about 120 years ago that they started traveling to these islands and establishing like a healthy population. I don't believe that they're exactly like adapting in a way, but more so that they're using different types of behaviors to be able to produce more metabolic water. Maybe their, conserv uh, their water conservation tactics are much better compared to the mainland populations or because metabolic water production is directly tied to metabolism, that way, um, they may be just heating themselves up more, but making their body temperature go uh, go more up since they're ectotherms. They solely depend; their metabolism depends on the outs, their environmental temperatures. So, therefore, these snakes may be just staying out in the sun more, so they're able to produce more water and are at the same time retaining more water through this. Oh, that's really cool. Um, what are they eating on those islands? I'm just curious. Uh, they probably are eating just small mammals found there, maybe even birds that are traveling through these areas and everything. And I bet that there's still small lizards and even just, even maybe they're eating other smaller snakes. They are opportunistic eaters, so anything that they're able to find to eat, they will eat it. Gotcha. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering now about uh, the meeting. So this you, you mentioned earlier that this is the first big meeting that you've had the chance to attend. Oh, yeah. Uh, are you enjoying it? Is it fun? Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's been very interesting meeting people, and especially uh, I'm the only person at ODU right now that studies reptiles, so it was very interesting to be around people who actually understand reptiles, and I'm not the only one having to explain every single little thing about them for them to understand what I'm talking about. I totally understand it. Thank you. You are very good at explaining these to lay people because I definitely need the, I definitely need the help. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Next, I had a chance to talk with Maisie McKnight, a PhD candidate at Penn State. Her talk on Saturday was part of an excellent series on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in particular, she was talking about field work and the ways in which it could be made more inclusive and safe for all participants. But I'll let her explain. Thank you very much for joining me today. Happy to be here. Okay, so I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about uh, your talk that's on Saturday and specifically, you know, field work and inclusivity. What What's the main topic of the discussion? Sure. So uh, this talk is really a summation of um, a project that's been going on now for almost two years. Uh, it originally started off as a service assistantship for my department mm -hmm. just to work on something DEI related. And, you know, we thought that this was going to be a nice packaged, concise you know, field safety um, project where we would look at how we can build more inclusive spaces uh, when we send field teams out to do ecology related work. And then it quickly just exploded into this, what I think really cool project. Um, and the kind of summation of all of it is this uh, field safety 
document, but it's not like regular field safety documents that are just talking about, you know, the environmental hazards, like what do you do if you get in a car crash, or how do you not get envenomated by a snake? Uh, the goal of me writing this document was to really help PIs and field um, crews critically evaluate how they can support their students and foster a culture of inclusion that really allows people to have empowering experiences in the field. And I wanted to know, you know, I had my own ideas of what empowering felt like sure. with my experiences um, as an undergraduate and then a field tech before coming to Penn State. Um, and so like I knew what felt good, but I wanted to know what other people in my department had to say about how they define empowerment and what learning objectives they had for their students. Right. And so then I hosted these facilitated discussions within my department, asking them, you know, what their learning objectives were and what their needs were um, as students going out in the field or as professors who are coordinating these uh, field excursions. You know, what do you expect of you, of you know your respective supervisor technician role? Um, and how can we, you know, articulate those needs and responsibilities so that we have better communication and we can um, set expectations like before people even get into the field? That makes a lot of sense. I'm wondering, you know, what what are kind of the main issues or some of the big issues um, that popped up in those types of discussions? You know, what what types of things um, you know were making people feel empowered or conversely not feel empowered? Um, you know, in the way that things have been done historically? Sure. So I think the big thing is that realizing that not everyone's experiences in the field are the same and realizing that your identities or how you're perceived by other people can really affect not only your experiences, but your actual safety in the field. Right. And so I, you know, proposed this field safety idea and you know, was met with some raised eyebrows. Like, how does this relate to DEI? And it was like, I don't see how this isn't related to DEI. Like sure. if we want to, you know, set these expectations and we want students to know what they're getting into before they get into the field van to drive off to the middle of the woods, like we need to be able to accurately disclose that risk. Right. So the idea behind this field safety document and why I've called it a right to know document stems from the legal precedent of you know, you have a right to know the risks that you encounter wherever you go. And we see this legal precedent in, you know, material or safety data sheets and wet lab spaces, but there's not really like a fieldwork equivalent. And so being able to have space in this document to say, hey, you know, we are heading into a predominantly, um, you know, conservative area and in COVID times as an Asian woman, you know, you have to be mindful of those things, you know, or hey, like public access to the trail can sometimes be difficult. So, you know, oftentimes we'll go and knock on people's doors and ask if we can park their cars and like understanding what kind of risks we take on to complete our work. Um, can then allow people to make an educated decision about whether or not they want to participate before they're, you know, in it. Yeah, and looking at this, you know, completely from the outside as a non-scientist, it's it always surprises me that you know a lot of the field work processes and, and habits were things that have been sort of formed over time, never really necessarily, you know, perhaps written down in the sort of way that you would if you were, uh, you know, talking about an ADA accessible wet laboratory like you were mentioning. Sure. Um, and so it seems like this gives an opportunity to sort of lay those things out in a way that you know lets people make sort of informed decisions about them. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, I want to give credit where credit is due. Like, I'm not the only one that's been thinking about this. Like, there's a lot of um, discussions and workshops that have, you know, come um, before me to talk about these issues. Um, you know, I'm not the only one that has had bad experiences in the field. Sure. But I think the really cool piece about what I've produced is that it's, you know, it's allowed us to say like you know okay from these workshops i know what these best practices are but this tool is going to help me actually apply it in my spaces 
That makes that makes a ton of sense. So, um, is the document published as yet? I'm working on it. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I have it right now. Um, I am just op I'm working on uploading it to Cubes. Sure. So that's like a it, my understanding of it is it's like GitHub for teachers, right. but that way it's you know linked back and attached with a license. Um, but right now it is housed on my website because to me it was more important to get it into the hands of the people that needed it and wanted it more than like going through the formal routes of publishing. My long-term goals for this project were to present it at a professional conference so I can check that box off. Right. Um, but then also to write it as a manuscript uh, with that kind of context of ground truthing it in all of the facilitated discussions that I hosted, as well as um, I do pre and post surveys of my volunteers when we go out into the field. Sure. So a lot of pre surveys are, um, you know, what are your expectations going into the field? Have you collected data before? You know, have you had positive or negative experiences in the field? Were they related to people or other things? And then that post season survey asks, you know, how did this, how did having this document affect your comfort in the field? Did it you know, was it for better or worse? How did it affect your com confidence or anxiety? Um, and so that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about on Saturday, but then that's more what I want to have in this manuscript because they can, you know, go online and look at my resource. I've given several workshops now um, that are more like hour and a half, two hours long, like what I did for SAR. Sure. Um, and so condensing all of that into a 15 minute presentation has been <laughs> an interesting um, journey f for me over the last few weeks. <laughs> that sounds incredibly challenging, but I mean, but, it, but also valuable. Ultimately, will you end up with a, a document that will be, um, you know, shared with PIs and others so that they can then take that and use that and, and share it with their fieldwork technicians, volunteers, students, et cetera? Yeah, that's 100% the goal. And first five minutes of the workshop, I say, goal of this workshop, introduce you to these ideas, provide you with these tools, motivate you to create your own. Like the idea is I have this document with examples from my research on red box salamanders, but then I have a complete, I have an attached appendix that is just a reverse engineered blank template for PIs to fill out for themselves. Oh, that's really cool. Since you mentioned it, let's go ahead and pivot and talk a little bit about perhaps your other talk or some of your field work. You know, what have you been working on in the field and what are you gonna be talking about um, in your other presentation this week? Sure, so I am a PhD candidate in the ecology program at Penn State. And I am mostly interested in the, when I came to State College, I you know, was really interested in the movement ecology of amphibians and particularly salamanders. Um, and so, you know, I was really fortunate to have found my advisor, uh, shout out to Dave Miller. And uh, he kind of looped me into the SparkNet world. So SparkNet is the Salamander Population Adaptation Collaborative Research Network. And it's this group of really incredible scientists that are using redback salamanders and this standardized surveying protocol to look at you know, salamander populations and how they're responding to climate change across its geographic range. Right. And so I have this kind of standardized um, protocol for how to survey my salamanders, and we're trying to get information um, about how they move and how their movement is allowing them to respond to climate change through the SparkNet protocols. But detecting movement in red box salamanders is really, really difficult. And I don't think anyone really told me that before <laughs> I came here. Right. I was just like, yeah, I want to study movement in salamanders. And then I somehow picked this, or not even picked, I somehow stumbled upon this like poster child salamander for not moving. It, oh, their, really? their natural history is actually pretty incredible. They don't have like that traditional aquatic larval stage. And so their entire lives can be contained in, you know, a few like 10 square meters, like incredibly small home ranges. They, once they find their territory, they hunker down. So studying movement's been really fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, and a bunch of other people that have come before me are working on using pit tags. So passive integrated transponder tags okay. um, and passive telemetry to study, to track and study in the movement of redback salamanders. Right. Um, so the talk that I'm going to be giving on 
Sunday is about my success with pit tagging red box salamanders and, you know, asking questions about how do we, you know, formally assess the efficacy of methods in novel study systems because, you know, we have entire journals like Methods in Ecology and Evolution yeah. that, you know, are devoted to developing these new methods and testing them. Right. But we don't really have like a universal framework for doing that. Like there's not really a standard. They just kind of are like, oh, you know, this method didn't affect survival and it didn't break the bank. So okay, yeah. it was probably good. But, you know, there there are other things that maybe we need to consider, um, again, depending on research objectives and financial constraints that go into whether or not this method is going to be a good method for that group in that study system. Right. So I basically stepped through these four different criteria that I've, um, I don't even really want to say developed because it, it's not I've summarized sure. from what other people have <laughs> said was important. Um, and then <laughs> used um, my study my study as kind of a case study for, okay, let's like walk through these four steps um, and see how pit tags and redback salamanders are doing in relation to this framework that I've laid out. Okay, that's so cool. So um, is, is, the, is the basic idea that by surveying them, you can find out if they've, you know, sort of, they don't move a lot. But if, but if they were to, you know, you're, you're checking to see if they're responding to climate change stressors or those types of things? Yep. So the, the cool thing about the pit tags is that we can detect them without getting them in hand. And so that's really exciting for a fossorial species that lives underground. So we can detect the salamanders even when they're not immediately underneath the cover boards. And so the piece with detecting movement and there's, you know, whole subdisciplines of geneticists that use, you know, genetic information to track movements of popu movements and establishments of populations. And then you also have population ecologists that are tracking individuals over time and space. But to do that, it's really difficult because you have to not only catch the animal multiple times, but you have to find that animal in multiple different places. And so those spatial recaptures are really difficult to get sure. um, with these tiny salamanders that are notorious for not moving a whole lot. Um, so having these pit tags as kind of a secondary method for surveying generates additional data that we can then use, yeah, to put into models or make inferences about response to climate change. Now that sounds really cool. And, it, and I would imagine that if you had to get them in hand anyway, that would probably affect their movement in some way or another? Potentially. I mean, so we, for cover board surveys in particular, so cover boards just, you know, a, we have like a foot by foot, um, block of wood that we just sure. kind of we don't throw we don't throw them around the woods i say no, 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 i no. say like throw them around the woods <laughs> we systematically place them in a grid very carefully um, very carefully yeah so we have these grids you know per our SparkNet protocol and then we go out and we flip these boards um but there the research suggests that we can't you know flip those boards every every day um sure. because that would create disturbance and then the salamanders would habituate to that disturbance and eventually leave because okay. you can imagine like you're sitting in your living room like hanging out and then all of a sudden this giant hand comes down and lifts the roof off of your house I'm, like I'm you moving. I mean, you're yeah. moving yeah exactly okay. so the salamanders feel the same way sure. um so i don't i don't know uh how much work has been done particularly with redback salamanders and handling stressors but i do know that there is work that suggests that you know, we have to be careful about how often we survey with cover boards. But again, that brings me back to the pit tag thing. Because we're not disturbing the habitat in any kind of way, we're just running a pit tag antenna, a portable pit tag antenna over the surface of the forest. We can do multiple surveys even within a single night oh, that's and cool. not worry about um, impacting their behavior as much. So one of the SparkNet folks actually just published a really cool paper looking at, you know, pit tags and their effect on salamanders. And he looked at things like growth and survival, but then he also looked at these behavioral responses. And, um, you know, based on Sean and colleagues work, like the pit tags aren't affect the electromagnetic fields of the pit tags aren't affecting their behavior. Yeah. Oh, that's really, really cool. Um, and, I, you know, I, I look forward to seeing the talk and learning more. Mm -hmm. How are you enjoying the meeting? I think the 
meeting has been great. Yeah, I've great. learned a lot. Um, it's been really awesome to see people. This is my first meeting as a PhD candidate in person. And so it's been really cool to see people that I've been talking with on Zoom for years right. in person. And then likewise, I've been able to reconnect with my undergraduate lab um, and then people that, you know, have come through the uh, uh, the mayor's lab at UGA, but you know we maybe just like missed each other by a few years. So I've been really enjoying that and I'm looking forward to attending more talks as the conference goes on. That's really cool. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. It's, it's been a great chat. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. And next that day, I had a chance to head upstairs and have a chat with Oliver Shipley, who's a research professor at Stony Brook University in New York, and Maria Mans, who is a second year graduate student at Stony Brook in Mike Frisk's lab. They were there to chat with me about sharks, which is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So let's go straight to the interview. Uh, thank you both very much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for inviting us. It's exciting to be here. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about sharks. Yes. And specifically their movement and foraging behavior? Exactly, yeah. So um, could you tell me a little bit about what you're working on right now? Yeah, so one of the, the big fundamental questions that I've been interested in for a long time is the role of sharks in kind of mediating connectivity between d different ecosystems. So sharks, you know, they, they move a long way. They interact with a lot of different species a lot, in a lot of different places. And we're basically trying to understand you know, how that kind of ties into nutrient connectivity and as a result of that, kind of the resilience of different ecosystems. Because fundamentally, you know, as things are changing, we're interested in um, you know, how ecosystems are going to respond to things like habitat fragmentation, climate change, and part of the, um, you know, part of the, part of the story is really figuring out, you know, the role of sharks in terms of facilitating resilience. Um, and particularly how they connect different habitats. So in this case, is it they move nutrients around by eating something in one place and then traveling to another? Yeah, exactly. So the you know they you know, obviously they move really expansive dis uh, distances. They feed on a lot of different things. So they'll eat you know a fish in one place. They'll move somewhere else and they'll you know they'll they'll poop. Right. <laughs> and, right. And that and that nutrient transfer we think is really important for connecting ecosystems and therefore making them more resilient. So you were introduced to me by John Whiteman. So I'm going to guess that the method for studying this does it involve stable isotopes? <laughs> yes, it absolutely okay. involves stable isotopes. All right. Yes. So how I mean how does that work? So we can in, in layman's terms we can measure the chemical composition of a tissue and learn something about the sources of primary productivity um, that that are supporting the food web that a shark you know resides in or moves right. through. And we can use, um, you know, it's particularly carbon that we use to do that, um, to trace photosynthetic pathways. And then we use nitrogen um, in a lot of different contexts, but predominantly to understand where an animal kind of feeds within a food web. Okay, and, and do you do this by sampling the water? No, we do this by sampling, kind of sampling the shark. And we can, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we can do it now. As obviously, you know, as the field has kind of developed, we have a lot of different technological applications that we don't necessarily have to go out there and sample all the fish in the food web to figure out what's going on. We could just sample the tissues of a shark and figure out what trophic position it's at. But historically, we've had to go out there and kind of isotopically categorize a lot of different prey items in the food web to figure out how they're kind of assimilating or being assimilated into the shark's tissues. Okay, so can this give you information about, you know, what fish are in an area or were in an area? Or, or do you find out where the shark has been by what it's been eating? You can do both. I mean, so... Oh. The way that I've typically used isotopes is to understand how different species channel energy. So different ecosystems have different primary producers. Um, for example, seagrass, you know, seagrass beds, they have a very, very different isotopic composition to you know, uh, red algae that you'll find on coral reefs. Very, very different isotope value to phytoplankton that you find out in the open ocean. And we can use those differences to basically trace how that energy is assimilated in, into a shark because a shark's isotope value is reflective of you know, where it's channeling the majority of that energy from. Um, and so we can kind of place you know, the isotope values of a shark in this kind of um, mixing space between all of these different primary producers. Yeah, that's really cool. And I want to chat more in a moment about, you know, about the value of knowing um, about the ways that sharks are moving around and what they're doing and connecting food webs. Um, but I'd like to bring Maria into this. Absolutely. Uh, so what, are you, what do you work on? 
Um, so I guess in general, I look at the movement ecology of local shark species to the mid-Atlantic bite. So that includes dusky sharks, sandbar sharks, and tiger sharks, um, and then more offshore species like mako sharks and thresher sharks, and maybe some great white sharks. But So those are the main players. And we're looking at how environmental drivers are affecting their movement patterns or influencing their movement patterns, which is really important to get that baseline information with the ocean changing under climate change and things like that. What kind of environmental pressures are pushing these sharks around? So we're still, it's still an active area of research, but some common ones include temperature, uh, photo period, current velocity and direction, um, and their food. Right. So um, what kinds of things are you finding? So right now, and our, our results are very, very preliminary. So we use acoustic telemetry, so we're tracking them, and then we can increment different environmental variables into models that predict which um, environmental variables are most significant in their decision to start migrating or to go somewhere. And right now we're finding that temperature and photo period are very um, influential, but it's still a work in progress and those are very preliminary results. Okay, and you, uh, you mentioned telemetry. How exactly are you finding out where the sharks are going? So acoustic, there's two different types of telemetry methods okay. that are commonly used, active and passive tracking. So active tracking, if you go to some of the talks, is satellite telemetry and it's very real-time data. Our lab uses passive tracking methods, which is acoustic telemetry. So essentially, we have acoustic receivers, which are just hydrophones that we place in known locations. Um, we have a bunch off the south shore of Long Island, and they are just constantly listening for these tags that we surgically implement into the sharks. And the tag is just constantly pinging the sharks unique ID so we know what shark it is, uh, the size, the sex, um, and the individual. And then it also gives the date and time. So we know when the shark passes that, li that listening kind of range for the hydrophone, uh, what shark it was and when it passed in a known location. Oh, that's cool. So is this the same technology that's used to generate the, the um, heads ups that I get on Facebook that, uh, for instance, a, a large shark has moved into yeah, the Chesapeake Bay? Yeah, if you have that O-Search app. Yep, it's, it's a very similar technology, yeah. So we can just kind of over time build up databases and get very um, robust movement patterns and see their migratory pathways or if they just hang out in a certain location and learn a lot about their movements. And is it too early to know if you know that's definitely being affected by climate change? I mean, we would assume it would be, I guess. Um, that's a good question. So there's definitely studies coming out showing that different species will have to kind of shift their range poleward. But then if you listen to some of the talks today, some of the studies showed that like bull sharks, for instance, may have a little bit more resilience to their thermal tolerance. So it's kind of species specific and still a really active area of research. Okay, and I, I think this is a question for both of you. Um, but in general, what would one hope to do with this information after you had gathered it? Um, you know, either from a conservation perspective or uh, you know, a monitoring perspective. What what kinds of things would you like to see managers do, um, and you know, perhaps even lawmakers, members of the general public do, um, you know, with the ultimate results of the work that you're doing now? Um, so I guess on the movement side of things, it's really important to know a their baseline, um, I guess, habitat use. So then you and when they are in a certain area, so you can start implementing things like time area closures and appropriate fishing regulations because shark populations haven't been doing so well in the past. Uh, so if, for instance, their habitat use changes with climate change, then you may have to shift where these essential fish habitats or MPAs or time area closures are to appropriately manage the species. Yeah, and when we think about shark foraging, one of the, the really kind of important questions that we're trying to address is obviously with, with climate change and, and changing ocean conditions, it's gonna, they're going to change where we find different species. And so we... Predict, we're predicting, and with some of you know, Maria's stuff, that the distribution of different shark species might change over time. Also, the distribution of their prey is going to change as well, which changes where those key foraging interactions are taking place. So we're trying to figuring out, you know, trying to figure out what the key forage base for different sh shark species are, and where they're taking place, and how that's going to change, and how that's potentially mediated and modulated by different climactic regimes. Um, from 
the kind of energy flow perspective, um, we're interested in, you know, it becomes a question of carbon, right? Everybody's worried about carbon, carbon storage, and there's a, you know, a big kind of emphasis on this idea of blue carbon, you know, big animals that move around that, that you know, store carbon over long periods of time and sometimes even sequester it to, to areas like the deep ocean. And, and for me, like, the, the first step is figuring out which of these different systems sharks are using and how they're connecting them. And then it's actually trying to put a value on how much carbon is, is, is an individual transporting between one system and another. And so how does that kind of impact things like, you know, the global climate, but the sorry, global um, carbon budget, which it very, very well could do. And it's a really poorly constrained kind of parameter in those models. And we've, we've had evidence to suggest that whales, you know, store and transport massive amounts of carbon and are kind of significant players in that carbon budget. And sharks do exactly the same thing. Unfortunately, you know, there aren't as many sharks in the ocean now as there were, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Um, you know, and so we can, you know, start to evaluate what the actual role, you know, for the biochemistry of the ocean is associated with the removal of, of animals, which is something that not many people, I don't think, are really thinking about. No, moment. that's really fascinating work. I, I look forward to hearing more. Um, one, one last question about the meeting. Uh, how are you finding it so far? The meeting's great. The The last um, AES meeting I, I came to was Sharks International in 2018. So it's been like five years since I've, I've, you know, seen a lot of the people here. And so it's been really, really nice to connect with, with old colleagues and, you know, meet new prospective graduate students and stuff like that. So it's always really, really enjoyable. This is my first AES meeting, actually. Cool. So it blew my expectations out of the water. It's very, very cool to kind of see what everybody else is doing in shark research and all the great approaches that people are taking. And I'm really excited to go to future meetings and see how their projects have developed. That's fantastic. Um, and I'll, I'll ask one very stupid shark behavioral question that has nothing to do with what you do. Um, but I'm curious, so I'm going to ask it anyway, and then I'll probably cut it out later. But um, so <laughs> there's a place I go that's off the eastern shore right around here. Um, and, you know, I, I paddle out between two small islands. It's a very narrow channel, only a few feet wide. And every single time I paddle out of that channel into the little bay, um, I get a bunch of fins up around me. Or not maybe every single time, but about half the time. Um, I don't, I'm not sure of the species because I'm not a shark biologist or any, a biologist at all. But what the heck are they doing? Are they just checking me out? Or are they, you know, are they curious? Are they thinking, you know, maybe my, maybe my kayak looks delicious? I don't know. I... Don't I mean? And do they only appear when your kayak is going through this area, or are they? Or can you see them as you're kind of approaching? I don't see them as I'm approaching. It's I, I I see them kind of when I pop out, and I assume it's the paddle noise or something like that. That's. I mean, potentially, you know, I, you know, yeah, paddling, I guess, could mimic, you know, some of the sounds that might be associated with a fish at the surface or something like that, and that might be, you know, bringing them together. But the the chances are that if they're in a channel like that, there's a number of different reasons why you get aggregations of sharks in channels, and uh -huh. one of them is if there is a really strong. So some sharks have to swim in order to respire. Right. Some of them can sit on the bottom and buccal pump. Um, so basically, they, they can manually pass water um, through their sphericals and over their gills and, and oxygenate themselves that way. So they don't have to swim. They can sit on the seafloor to do that. Some sharks will actually orient their bodies in line with an oncoming really strong current. Oh, that makes to sense. Oxygenate. Yeah, so yeah, that makes sense for the area. If, if you're in a, a small channel with that, you know, a lot of these small channels have strong currents associated with them, then that could be why you're seeing a decent num number of them there. That's Why they're coming up to the surface when you're, when you're paddling through, I don't know though. Have you seen the fin or have you seen the body? Uh, I've only seen, I see the, the, the dorsal fin and then I see the tail. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. So, but the water there is very, very shallow. So that makes sense. Yeah. Take some photos next time. That's really <laughs> Videos. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. No, I have no photos because I'm usually too shocked and a lot. But anyway, thank you very much. I think that's probably the best answer I'll ever get to that question. So I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, thank you both very much for joining me today. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you for having us. Yeah, it's been great. It's thank great you. to meet you. And after I chatted with Oliver and Maria, I was perusing the booths area, which is one of my favorite things to do at meetings. And I had a chance to sit down with Erin Anthony, who's the president of the Virginia Herpetological Society. And she told me about some of their great programs and, in fact, probably helped me plan a family excursion for later on this year. So let's go straight to that interview. Thank you very much for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. Okay, so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the Virginia Herpetological Society. Mm -hmm. So we're a society that has been around since 1958, and we focus on the education, conservation, and research of our native herpetofauna, reptiles and amphibians. So we'll give a lot of 
uh, grant money, we'll try and support researchers in the field, we'll come to classrooms, we'll do virtual talks. Uh, last year we educated 77,000 people that we were able to keep track of. Um, so we do a lot. How, I mean, how did you reach the 77,000 people? That's a big number. Well, 45,000 of them was from one virtual talk. Oh, wow. <laughs> but we, we did 36 events total. Oh, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I got to ask, what was the talk about? It was for World Turtle Day, and we were requested by the Wildlife Center of Virginia, and our education committee member, Anna Sparks, got, went on there, and they live-streamed the whole thing off of Facebook. We reached... 45,000, because that was an accurate count. We could actually tell how many people were on there. <laughs> that is incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, tell me a little bit about uh, what the outreach is like. I mean, is it is it is a lot of classroom outreach, or what kind of things go on? It's whoever approaches us. So if we have people say, hey, we have a new state park. Can you please see what's in the state park? We do a lot of on-the-ground stuff, too. People will be hiking by and going, mm, why are you off in the woods? pulling up snakes what's going on right like oh what an excellent way to introduce ourselves we are not just crazy people out here we are crazy people in an organization so. <laughs> <laughs> always always a little bit yeah. more reassuring <laughs> yeah. no that's that's really cool um so what brought you to this meeting so it's in virginia and we really wanted to reach across state lines and rub elbows with other organizations that have uh, the best interests of herps in mind. Uh, we have creatures that range not only in Virginia, but they go all the way up to Canada. They go all the way down into Florida, uh, all the way to Mississippi. Like We've got to be able to protect these species, not just in Virginia, but all throughout their range. And what better way to do that than by communicating? Right. And getting together with everybody who's working on similar issues um, across the landscape. So any advice to people who are you know, out recreating and they happen to see something? I imagine the, the standard advice is don't touch it. If you can't identify it, don't touch it. <laughs> That's uh, some wise advice. Yes, I have people like holding snakes and going, "Is this venomous?" And like, well, if you don't know, why <laughs> did you pick this up? But uh, my general advice, not just that, but put things back. We have so many herpers who will flip a log and then leave that log flipped. Oh, uh, okay. We really need to put things back so that that habitat still exists. Have you had a chance to attend any um, sessions during the meeting? Oh, yes. Yes, oh, that's definitely. Great. Any favorites? Or? So far, I've really enjoyed this one. I um, can't remember who gave it, but she was working out in California and looking at frog populations and seeing how the dam, they were taking down the dams in California. Right. And uh, she wanted to see how the dam impacted the frog populations, and she predicted it to be positive. But there was one year right before the dam went down uh, that they had a huge spike in population. And so she dedicated the rest of her talk to like trying to figure out why <laughs> what was going on and she you know of course can't prove this because that's not what she was studying but evidence looks like if we looked at recreational habits along that river we would see that they had a huge impact on um, frog populations so there was a reggae music festival that stopped uh, it was moved uh, three years prior and that frog needed three years to become an adult so oh wow that probably was just the stopping of the music festival that allowed them to have such a great population boom oh, before the dam so was cool. even <laughs> taken down. Well, thank you very much for taking the time and letting me tear you away from that table. Um, I appreciate it very much. Of course. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. And last but certainly not least is Sarah Yaris, a master's student at the University of Washington in the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. I just watched her extremely engaging talk on lionfish, and she was gracious enough to sit down with me to share some of her research with you. So let's go to this last interview. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about lionfish? Yes, absolutely. Okay, can you tell me just to get us started a little bit about lionfish? Yeah, lionfish get a pretty bad rap, especially in the scientific community and out there in general, because they're incredibly invasive in the Western Atlantic. Right. They're native to the Indo-Pacific region, so okay. over there they're totally fine, but in the Western Atlantic, they're really bad news, and it's pretty much an ecological disaster on reefs. Yeah, I mean, I, I, only, I hear about them through fishing circles where the idea is catch and kill as many as you possibly can. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's the overall management goal is to get rid of as many lionfish as one possibly could? Yeah, and it's pretty difficult to do because of how robust and how fast they can reproduce. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think I should mention, because people will be listening to this, that they are a very beautiful fish. They're gorgeous. You could say it much better than I could possibly could, but they've got, you know, fins that are well adorned, you know? Mm -hmm. How would you describe them? Um, I think just absolutely a work of art. The way that evolution has designed this fish to perfectly 
like almost put its prey in a trance. Um, a big reason why they're so successful and devastating on our reefs is because the fish don't recognize what's even coming at them. So they just sit there and then the lionfish scoops them up and eats them. Okay, so they don't, they don't realize that they're being approached by a predator. They just, you know. No, not at all. Okay, and they eat a lot of other fish, um, a lot of fish that might be of you know, interest to you know, various fisheries managers, etc. Mm -hmm. um, what was your work on in the talk that you gave um, yesterday? Yesterday, I'm looking at trying to fully describe lionfish diet. And what I mean by that is a lot of work in the ocean in general, but specifically also with lionfish, is that it's very easy to study things within recreational diving limits because you can throw on scuba gear and you can access pretty much anything or snorkel gear, anything above 30 meters which is about uh, 130 feet. Okay. So in, in that case, you know, you, you would go down and you'd see them, collect them, and, yes. and you know, analyze their gut contents, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, and so you'd know what they're eating. Yes. And, but, but they go deeper than 130 feet, yes. right? Okay, so um, that, that's a major research gap, it sounds like. Um, and you know, nobody had done this before. Mm -hmm. um, how did you do it? How do you, how do you get down there and, and have a look at these things? Yeah, so lionfish have been observed down to 250 to 300 meters very deep, um, so close to a thousand feet, and this depends on various location to location depending on how cold it gets because they don't handle cold very well. But to get down there, we used a manned submersible, the Curasub specifically, that's in Curacao. Okay. Um, and it took a lot of trial and error. It was pretty difficult to get a reloadable spear. There's so many technical difficulties that could go wrong, did go wrong. We needed to troubleshoot. Just the logistics of maneuvering this huge sub to catch this fish on a reef that's trying to evade you. Okay, now we have it on the spear. We need to get it right. off the spear into a basket. Now we need to reload the spear. Okay, now the fish is awake and trying to swim away. Um, so we used some anesthetic to try and put them, you know, to sleep. Right. Um, but then after like 10 minutes, they're up and about and they don't even care that they just been shot by a spear. They, they're just they're going just on their way. On. Yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. So, I mean, that sounds like an incredible difficulty because, you know, I, I've known a couple of spear fishermen and it, it, not always successful, even when, you know, they're right at the water, right at the surface. And this you're doing it through the articulated arms of a, yes. of a submersible. Yes. Okay. So how many, do, how many were you able to capture? So I have a total, I think the exact number is 137, wow. maybe 138 fish. Half of them were above 40 meters, sure. so we caught on scuba. The other half came from below and were caught with the man submersible. Oh, wow. That's an excitingly high number. And, and what are they eating? Anything that will fit in their mouth. Okay, honestly. that's not good. <laughs> um, so, you know, you know, what are the results like for fisheries? I mean, what do you know? Can we anticipate about the impact that they're having or will have? Yeah. So, um, it's hard to give any specifics for my study right now because mm -hmm. I very recently received um, my sequences. But I can talk more broadly in general about what we're seeing. Sure. Um, so they do feed primarily on teleos, which is just bony fish. So any fish that you think of is probably a bony fish. Um, but they also do feed on like crabs and shrimps, so some invertebrates. I also saw one instance of an octopus, which was really cool. Um, and what we've seen by studying shallow reefs is they reduce the biomass, which is how much fish is on a reef or um, in terms of like the mass. And then um, biodiversity, so they're reducing the different numbers of fish. And then they're also reducing recruitment, which is how successful fish are um, f moving from like larval to adult stages and being reproductive on reefs. Okay, and now an out of order question that I just thought of, uh, but are they venomous, poisonous? What's their, what's their status? What's going on? Um, I believe it's venomous, okay. but um, they're venomous in their dorsal spines, um, anal spines and pectoral spines, or excuse me, pelvic spines. But once you remove those spines, they're totally safe to eat and they're great eating. So if you see them on a restaurant menu, you can feel good. You're helping out the reef, eat those lionfish. Yeah, you're not eating anything dangerous. It's You're, you're good to go. No, yeah, the flesh is perfectly safe. Okay, great. And what's uh, what's next for your research? Um, so I really want to get in and get hands-on with my data and maybe do more of a direct comparison of what the first study found with metabarcoding versus what my study found by going deeper than 40 meters. I also want to look at other factors across depth, like age, size, maturity, maybe how many males versus how many females across depth. Because really, 
there hasn't been any studies on lionfish below 40 meters. So we just don't know what they're doing down there. I mean, right. why would you move away from a reef with so many fish and go down into the deep? What, like, yeah, I mean, what that's, are they doing? That's a really interesting question. <laughs> I mean, do you have, do you have any inc early inklings or is this still work to be done? Well, some hypothesis is, you know, of course, we're trying to get rid of them. So they're experiencing really intense fishing pressure. So is it possible that they're just moving down there to avoid spear fishing? I right. mean, maybe, but then why go all the way to 300 meters when you could just go to like 100 and be probably fine? Yeah, that's, that's really exciting. Uh, but anyway, I, I thank you very much for joining me today. This has been great. Thank you so much. And that concludes this special episode of Bioscience Talks from the JMIH. A big thank you to the organizing societies and all of those who joined me for the episode. I had a lot of fun. As always, Bioscience is published by the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you.